Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. Can you hear me? Louder! Louder! That's it. I'm Sergio Riva, as you just heard. I'm uh, the owner of the restaurant. I uh, also am the person behind the design and the construction, the reconstruction of this space. Uh, tonight, we will be discussing uh, the history of 157 Bleaker, what I could find out, the history I could find out about 157 Bleaker, uh, along with the reconstruction of the building and what we were able to uncover in the process of rebuilding. Uh, I also have uh, Scott Jordan here who will be coming up later to discuss a little bit about what he does and, um, and how we were able to work together on this project. We will then have a quick uh, uh, question and answer uh, maybe uh, a little question and answer session, and then we're all, go all going to go on a tour of the restaurant. It's a bigger crowd than expected, but we'll, we'll, we'll all get through the restaurant so we can tour what we did. Um, let's, uh, let's start by discussing, first of all, why we picked this location. Uh, well, being a, a native New Yorker, I grew up in New York City, um, I went to the UN school. Uh, I would, I, I, as a young adult, I would come to Kenny's. I would go to CBGB's. I would, um, I would, I would. You know, I love the, the music scene that was here. Uh, there's no doubt that Kenny's played a big part of the the history of the New York, New York music. Um, so, so one of the main reasons that attracted me. I own restaurants all over the city, but one of the main reasons that attracted me to this space is Kenny's Castaways. And to be able to, to have a piece of that history and be able to, to uncover it, um, that alone was enough for me. Um, so that's basically how I got to, you know, I, I heard it was the space was up for, for lease, I, I met with the broker. And Sergio? I was in, yes. Louder. Louder. We got all the noise from Sorry about that. And, sorry about that. So I, I basically secured, was able to secure this space because I really, really wanted to be part of uncovering the history here. Um, okay, as I, as I further look, research the history of this space, uh, I realized the magnitude of history was much greater than that of, of uh, Kenny's Castaway. An example is Showboat, which I was just told about, and most people don't, don't know about Showboat, uh, but we have a guest here that does. Um, so, uh, you know, in, in doing my research on the space, I, I, I found out that this actual location at 157 Bleecker Street had been a restaurant, bar, or music venue for over 125 years. So from the 1880s, it was some sort of a bar, saloon, restaurant, music venue. Um, I also found out that it was the first gay brothel. It was, a, it was a, called a slide back in uh, the late 1800s. Uh, also was the home of a famed uh, Italian figure, Luigi Fugazi, who changed his name to Fugazi later. Um, and, and then I was doing research on the maps. I love old maps and I, I did research on a map in 1833. This section, a section between Thompson Street and Lawrence Street, which is now called LaGuardia, a section was called Carroll Place, which is why we named the venue Carroll Place, mm -hmm. like homage to the street name. Back in the back in the the, uh, the 1800s, developers would buy an entire block, and they would change the name of the block to give new life to that block. Uh, Bleecker Street is such an old street that developers would have to find ways to to, to make it seem new by changing names, etc. Um, so that's that's uh, that's why we, we got involved with this location. Uh, to speak a little bit about the history. I uh, did a little research and was trying to find out uh, as much about the building as possible. As far back as I can see, the building was built in 1830. It was built as a two-story uh, tenement. It was a tenement building, two-story tenement building. Uh, it was only built 25 foot wide by 50 feet deep. It had a 50 foot backyard. And typically the backyard, it was used for your outhouse, your privy, uh, and your backyard. So 
So the initial building was only built, now it's three stories, and it's built a full length. Uh, but the initial building in 1830 was only 50 feet deep. And that was typical of how most buildings were built uh, in the 1800s. Uh, in 1855, I, I read in a small article about a, a notary and accountant that lived here by the name of A. Porter. Uh, he either worked or lived here. Uh, in 1884, uh, it was the first records of the saloon that I could find. So the first saloon, as I mentioned, was, was opened here at 18, in 1884. It was owned by, the, the saloon, I'm not sure who owned it, but the building was owned by, by D. Silverstein. He was the actual owner of the building. Um, yeah, and and uh, and he owned it for for uh, for uh, at least 20 years, and different venues were, were being opened and closed in that time. Uh, in uh, 19 in 1890 is when the slide opened up, which was in the basement of the existing saloon. Uh, the owner's name of the saloon and the slide was Frank Stevenson. It was notorious for its scandalous acts performed there every night. <laughs> and uh, by some, you know, some people thought it um, called, it, it was known as the, as morally the lowest venue in New York. <laughs> That's the kind of acts that they would have. And, 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 and it was, it was, it was in the world, it was compared to, to venues in London, in Paris, and in Berlin. And it was supposedly the lowest of all the cities in the world. Um, however, one could argue that it's these same acts that would help make New York what it is today, one of, one of the most liberal cities in the world. And it was the beginning of what still makes New York great today. Um, in, uh, there's an article about, about a, a cook uh, in 1898, who, uh, an Italian cook named Carlo Balocchio, who went mad one night, went crazy one night, ran out of the kitchen and started stabbing, stabbing the patrons in the, in the saloon. Then the police came, he ran out, and they chased him, and he ended up stabbing himself in the abdomen, and they sent him a bell. He, he, was, he didn't die, but it was kind of a crazy, crazy night. Uh, being in the restaurant industry, I've never seen some crazy nights. I've never seen anything like that, but uh, maybe that's what, what happened in the 1800s. Um, in, uh, in 1901, uh, Pietro di Silvestri uh, was an Italian, he opened up an Italian music hall in this venue. He had that from 1901 to 1904. In 1904, Luigi, Luigi Fugazi, which we spoke about, he later changed his name to Fugazi, so he can assimilate being American. Uh, he, he, Fugazi originally was from Liguria. He served under Garibaldi and helped unite Italy back in uh, the 1860s. He immigrated here in 1869, uh, and he was considered possibly the most famous padrone in, in all of New York. Now, Padroni was a, a, a businessman who acted as a middleman to help his Italian, Italian immigrants adjust to life in America and help them get things done, like get an apartment, uh, find a job, uh, get tickets, uh, um, buy tickets, uh, steamship tickets so, so they can go back to Italy and bring some relatives back to New York. Um, he helped them. Uh, notarized documents, um, and he actually opened up a bank. Um, he, he passed in uh, he passed in 1930, and actually was still living here when he passed. He was survived by his uh, wife and his children. Uh, his wife uh, in 1938. Actually, I have a picture of you guys if you want to see. Yes. That is it. He, again, he's from Liguria which is the northwest coast of Italy. Uh, it, was an it was an affluent area, and he was uh, very well decorated. I, I believe he came from wealth. Um, in, in 1938, Maria Fugazi, Fugazi, his wife, uh, actually transferred the property into her name, um, and then two years later, she sold it to 
George and Samuel Adler, uh, who, laid, who, who, who uh, ended up opening up a, uh, the Bleecker Street Tavern with a family member, Edward. That was in 1940. I'm not sure how long the, it was the Bleecker Street Tavern, but I know it was in 1963, it was a, a different restaurant called Mod, Mod Scene. And in 1967, I believe it was Shobo, which is which makes sense, right before uh, uh, Kenny's. In 1974 is when Kenny's Castaways, who had an uptown location on the Upper East Side, who actually moved downtown into this location. Um, I mean, it would become the Kenny's Castaways that we all know. I, mean, I believe we all know about Kenny's Castaways, but you know, artists like Bruce Springsteen played here, Billy played some of his first shows in New York here. Um, artists like Willie Niles got the first break here. Patti Smith and Fish all, all got the first breaks here. In uh, 1996, Kenny actually purchased the building from D. Silverstein. So, I mean, from uh, Adler's. So, in 1996, Kenny, oh, he was a tenant for 20 years. He purchased the building from the Adlers, and um, and then in uh, in 2013, the Kenny family, because Pat Kenny had died uh, before that, uh, the Kenny family sold the building to Trevi Retail. Sold the building to Trevi Retail, who is our present day owner, who we have a lease. We le we lease the space from Trevi Retail. So that's a little bit about the history, what I could find out uh, about the building. Um, let's talk a little bit about the project, uh, the scope of the project, and um, you know what we did here while we were renovating and building, and what we were trying to do. Because of this extensive history of the building, I knew that I would have to try and save as much of the elements, whatever they were, as I could find. Um, for reuse later. I knew whatever was, I was pulling out of here, I was going to reuse it later. That was, I knew I had to do that. So, um, so that, that includes all of the wood joists that keep all, that was supporting all the floors. We removed them one by one, and we stored them in our warehouse out in New Jersey. We knew that we'd be bringing them back to reuse. Um, we, you know, when we did bring them back, at, at one point, we, I believe the landlord was doing renovations in the second and third floor, and he also removed all the old beams. The building was built too close to 200 years ago, so the beams were in total disrepair. It would cost more money to repair than to redo new, so we knew we had to do it, and we could use the wood. I mean, um, while, when we brought all the beams back, uh, to, to we actually milled them on site. So my laborers and carpenters here were milling, were taking these huge beams. They're 23 feet long, 12 feet high, 12 inches high by three or four inches wide, and they were milling them here on a ta on, on a big contractor table saw. We went through three table saws in four months. That's how much wood. Every day, all day long, what we're doing is milling the wood, milling it so we could make. We made the storefront entirely out of that wood. We made most of our tables out of that wood. All the, a lot of the wood paneling you see downstairs in the stairwell, we made out of that wood. Um, we, we also uh, made the interior doors. Our interior door, doors are made with this old wood. Uh, shelving and a lot of decorative elements. Now the reason I knew I could make it, it, to make doors with this wood is because the wood was so old that it had very little, it had no moisture in the wood. It was 200 years old, so, I had no, so that the key of making any furniture or doors is you have to make sure there's no more moisture so it doesn't twist and turn on you. Well, these beams were so old that they were very stable, and um, and we were able to uh, make great great doors that haven't changed. We've been open for a year and a half, and we're really happy about how they. How they turned out. Um, another thing we found here 
while we were doing the renovation is underneath the Kenny's stage, which I'm not sure if Kenny installed the stage or the stage was there before, but under that stage, there was a mosaic floor that was in pristine condition. It was, must have been covered for at least 40 years. So we took, a, we took a chunk of that floor and we actually mounted it in the basement going to the bathroom, you'll see that. <clears throat> we also found an old, two old steam engine flywheels. I mean, at the time, I didn't know what they were. Luckily, I, I, luckily I met with uh, Scott. I showed him the, 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 these huge cast iron flywheels, and he he basically did a little research and said, "I thought they were they were actually um, train wheels. I thought they were wheels from a train or a wagon." And he basically informed me, "No, they were they were engine steam engine flywheels." So we took one of those wheels. We also mounted it uh, to the wall in the basement, going to the bathroom. You'll see that on the tour. Um, when we were doing the, the reconstruction and, and adding the new elements to the space, we knew that we had to make, we knew we were bringing back all this old, all this old character we're bringing back. We knew that the new elements had to match. So we, we, we worked really hard to make all the new elements look like they'd been here for a long time. Um, an example of this is the concrete floors downstairs. When you go on the tour, you'll see them. They're brand new floors on brand new steel beams, actually steel joists, on brand new uh, poured concrete. But we ended up, we, we, we dyed the, the concrete, we, we scuffed it up, we grinded it down, and we, lay, we, we poured it in such a way that it would crack as it was drying, just so it would look old and everything would match. It wouldn't be a brand new floor with these old elements just wouldn't, wouldn't work. Um, I mean, that's pretty much the, the gist of, of the construction. I wanted to bring, uh, I want to talk a little bit about Scott Jordan, who was key in, in, in putting this pro uh, project together, and uh, talk a little bit about the first time I saw Scott. Well, first of all, uh, I saw him, and he, was, he looked like a guy who was who was straight out of a, a uh, Gangs of New York movie. <laughs> he had the big hat and the facial hair. He was dressed with the suspenders. That's the first time I saw him. The, the, the second time I saw him, he was in my dumpster, just scavenging, looking for all types of pieces of wood and, and, and old wood lathing. I mean, we saved a lot. We saved two warehouses full of wood. And he was in there picking, <laughs> picking out more. He was saving more stuff. He was saving all the tin ceiling that was in there. So, um, so here's uh, here's Scott to talk a little bit about what he does. Hello. I'm an artist. Um, make my living. I was hollering the other day at a site, so I lost my voice a little bit. Um, I make my living from what I dig up in New York City. Um, I've been doing it about 28 years but digging since 69. I grew up on Governor's Island, and I, well, we all know it's a military base. My dad was in the Coast Guard, and we moved there in 1966. Coming from Connecticut, I, I didn't like the place. I mean, we lived in the woods in Connecticut. I was a little boy, and I walked around Governor's Island going, this place is horrible. It's, my dad said it's going to be beautiful with beaches and trees. And it was football fields and buildings and military personnel. I, I really was like, God, I don't like being here. So I was depressed for the first three years. But um, I made friends. And one day, uh, a friend of mine lived in Fort Jay. Now, I don't know if you guys have been there and seen this fort, but it's beautiful. They've got high granite walls and cannons on top. And as you know, there's like a drawbridge going into the opening. And my buddy, when I went to see him, I'm entering towards that tunnel. And under the drawbridge, I hear clanking and banging of shovels and voices. So, I'm a kid, it's 1969, and I go down the little steps to dry moat. and look under the bridge, and there's two teenage boys under there, sifting. And I said, what are you guys doing? And they said, we're finding artifacts from the Revolutionary War. <laughs> and we found a bottle with 1861 on it. And I'm like, wow. <laughs> I said, can I do that too? I said, well, you're going to need a sifter and a shovel, otherwise you can't find anything in the dirt. So I went home and told my dad the story, and um, he built a sifter for me the next day, and let me a shovel, and I went back. And there they were again, 
and they're a bit older than me. They're like 14, 15, and I'm 11. So um, we became digging buddies. And in my siftings, I uncovered um, military buttons uh, from the War of 1812, um, some Civil War. I found a bone dice. I found part of an uh, ivory napkin ring. Um, little bits of pottery, kids play marbles. I found a brass ring from Buffalo Bill's Wild West show, a souvenir ring, um, like that. Some musket balls, some mini bullets, some intact unshot Civil War bullets with their shells still on them. So I was hooked. This was the past coming to life for me. Because when you dig up something and touch it, it's exciting. You're the first one to make contact with that object. And it makes your heart race, you know? So. Um, in that, I eventually moved off of Governor's Island and um, met a guy named Zach on the Upper West Side where I was living. And he was my first real buddy friend in New York City. And we were walking by, uh, we're all the, our girlfriends and I take a walk down the, the West Side, right? And the girls are ways back behind us and I'm, we're up ahead and I'm telling Zach how like, I love old bottles and that's what I collect and I, I find them in the dirt. And he said, well, uh, that's cool, but i got gotten bottles too, but they're from when we might go with my parents to antique shops and stuff like that. And I love them too, but I didn't know you could dig them up the dirt. So we're talking and whatnot, and we're starting to pass this new construction site. And we look in, I said, like it would be in a place like this, you know? So we're looking through the fence, and, and he goes, I think I see a bottle back there. And the gate is open. So we decided to walk in, and we told the girls, we'll be back later, you know? Yep. So we walk into the site, and there's piles of ash, and you know they burn coal in New York to make heat. So the ash is what they threw away with the garbage in all of our landfills, basically. <laughs> Cans, ash, shells, um, food bones and bottles, really <coughs> basics, old shoes and hats, clothing, whatnot. Like so we go into there, and I got a bottle. Yeah, me too. I'll see one over here. So eventually, we're using our T-shirts to hold them and putting them in our back pockets and then making piles. And we gathered up enough that we were having trouble holding them all to get home. So Zach became my first true digging friend. Who his, He's sitting right back there. We just went digging today. <laughs> we were on that night. You know, he's only come for a short while to stay with us. And um, we wanted to make a digging adventure out of this. And as you know, it's been dry all these weeks. I said, Zach, it's going to be great when you get here. It's going to be the perfect digging weather. It's getting cooler. The rain starts to come. <laughs> rain the rest of the week. So we're going to be digging in the rain the next couple of days. But anyway, long story short, um, Zach and I ended up digging down in South Street Seaport on some of those big developments where they went down into the black mud um, in, the, in the landfill. Yeah, and we were retrieving uh, America's Revolutionary War artifacts. Uh, and in doing that, we of course couldn't get permission to dig. We had to go at night and hide from the guard. And our little thing was is to wait for the right moment when the guard wasn't looking. And then we had a special board in the fence we could pull out and slip in. And we had to climb down this 35, 40 foot ladder down into the black mud and only stay in the shadows and work with our metal detectors. This is black river mud, so it, it's hard to find the stuff unless you're finding metals. And then with our flashlights, we could see pottery fragments and things of that nature. But in the end, um, Zach did find a tricorn hat that's wearable from the Revolution. We got numbered buttons from the British and American coats and shoe buckles. I got an intact shoe. We got cannonballs, pewter plates, and a bunch of other really neat stuff. Some rum bottles and some earlier forms. I found my oldest bottle on that site, which is a 1690s um, low squat English wine bottle. So all this, so I eventually become an artist in the street. I had many jobs. I did building renovation, I did uh, house painting and deli work, and in the end um, I made a little collage from some artifacts that I had found on Staten Island from the Revolutionary War, from an old fort out there. And it was just some little bits of stuff that I thought was really neat, and I put it in a plaster of Paris with a paper frame. And my buddy Bill at the time saw this. He had uh, the only New York City bottle shop on the Upper East Side in the 70s. And I used to hang out and watch him sell, and learn about glass when I was a young man. So he saw the collage and said, Scott, you should make these and become a street artist and sell them and be your own boss. And he goes, you can become famous. We can have a gallery on Madison Avenue where I live. Well, we'll transform my apartment. So ends up that um, he convinces me to do this. I thought it was crazy. I made 20 collages, or about 10, 15 of whatever. 
and we pull up two days before Christmas in front of Zabar's <laughs> on the Upper West Side. There's snow on the ground, and my bit Dave and, and Bill are in the car, and I, they set up a table, put my cloth, my collages out, and they're all twenty dollars a piece, and they're painted plaster collages painted the background with watercolor and a little description on the back of the title. So they're sitting in the car watching me, and I'm freezing, it's cold. Two days before Christmas, and nobody buys anything. I got, I said, Bill, I'm done. I can't do this, Bill. Let's do, I'm throwing them out. He goes, no, 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 no. Wrap them up carefully. Take them back. And after Christmas, people buy things. Try in my neighborhood on Madison Avenue. So I follow his advice. It comes a few days after New Year. I put up my table on Madison, you know. He goes home, and got there. I'm standing. It's a gray day, and all of a sudden, Big flakes of snow start falling, and I'm like, oh no, it's starting to snow. So there's a bank right down the block, and I drag my table a ways down and pull it under the columns where there's these spotlights. And now people can see my art is getting a little dark. But people are taking the money out of their bank, and so they're looking at me, and I'm talking, and what I do. And I sold free. And they came back to the bill, I said, 60 bucks. And he goes, great. He slapped the guy, he goes, we're going to be in business. You're going to be famous. He was so enthusiastic. So, um, Long story short, it's 20, 28 years later. I've been a street artist all these years. I, I've taken from the street to the flea markets because uh, during Giuliani's time, the cops were rough on us. And it was really hard. And I don't want to keep you forever, but I had a little sign on my table. And I had it upside down all the time. And this little sign was printed in a nice block letter. It says, artwork, for uh, artwork by Scott Jordan, not for sale. So I had it upside down when the cops came. They started taking people away. I looked both ways and I flipped my sign over. When they came to me, in the First Amendment, you could show art, but you can't sell it. So you're allowed to show yourself as an artist. So when they come up to me, they say, what are you doing here? What are you selling? I said, it's, it's, I'm just showing my art because I'm teaching people history and letting people know about who I am until one day when I want to show, they'll know my name. So they would fall for it and leave and everybody would be going. And so so I had I had this happen one day. I, my spot was right by Barnes and Nobles on um, Fifth Avenue and 18th Street. That was my little nook. So I had my table. All the vendors were gone. I said, now what do I do? Now people are coming to my table and stopping. And one lady stops. She goes, oh, I love this piece. How much are they? I said, they're $20 in the collage. And she goes, I want this one. I said, but lady, lady, the cops are just here. And there's a cop around the corner of that building popping his head up to see if I'd sell. So he's watching us. But the crowds are thick. She goes, but I want to buy it. How do I do it? I said, look, look, I'm taking the collage. You take your 20 and stiff it under that, that one right there. Hide it under that collage so it doesn't float away. And I'm going to go down here. I'm wrapping it right now for you. And I reached under the table and put it at our feet. And I said, it, it's at your feet right now. And she goes, oh my god, this is so exciting. It's, it's like a drug deal. <laughs> and I, said, I said, yeah. And the guy didn't see us. He didn't see us. So I stayed a while longer and went home. And eventually, they were on to me in some kind of way, right? <laughs> so I had to switch sides. I, I maneuvered a little bit down. I went down a block. But other guys were getting taken away and girls were getting taken away again. So one day I'm out again selling and this lady comes up to my table and she has attitude. Now women are mostly my customers. They love history. They love art. She had attitude. She goes, how much are these? And I, so my heart told me, I go by my heart. My heart told me, do not tell her you're selling these. How much are these? She starts flipping and look, where are the prices? And I said, it's just a display, ma'am. And she pulls the chain out of her blouse with a badge on it. She goes, you are obstructing public walkway. I want you off this spot, and I don't want to see you again. Now I'm trembling. She goes, I can sweep your stuff into a plastic bag, and I can give you a ticket, and you'll have to go to court. But I'm not going to do it. I like what you do, blah, blah, blah. She was snippy, you know, so I packed it up, and I left. Now, I'm making my living doing this. I'm, I'm calling home, and I'm like, how am I going to pull this off? So I started going down to Prince, started going off Broadway, but that was the good spot down on Fifth Avenue in front of Arts and That was where my customers were happy. So eventually I worked it out, but after a while of this harassment, I just broke down and went to the flea markets. But what happened was, is I went back to that spot a month later, and she came back again, and she looked at me like this. She goes, you remember me? And I said, uh, yeah. She goes, that's strike two. Strike three, you're out. I want you off the sidewalk. Don't come back. So that's what really made me say, okay, I'm taking to the flea market. So I'm going to join a flea market. And I was safe. I didn't have to look over my shoulder, make a million prayers. Can I be safe today? 
and that was my little way of making a live. Well, it, it's something that you do for a, a passion and a love, but you don't make a lot of money at it. I just love what I do. I like uncovering the past here in New York. I like preserving something. And when we do an excavation on some developer's property or a homeowner's property, it's about sharing with them what we discover. So they can have a little display for their place or their office. So I was working next door next to Sergio's place. And of course, the building starts to get gutted and go on a renovation. And I'm like, at the time, I told my business partner, I'm like, they're working next door. I'm seeing a dumpster now. And there's wood in it. And I'm grabbing little lath pieces and other thing, boards from my art. Because I make um, shadow boxes. And the shadow box now, I, I kind of switched from plaster of Paris to um, shadow boxes using old wood from buildings in New York. So I pull them out of dumpsters, buy it from the workers. So um, these have a, a Kind of, I kind of went from having years of plaster and weird forms to just this square or rectangles, where people want to see an object in the box with fabric behind it, easy on the eye. So this became my new style, which it is today. So seeing the wood in his dumpster, I was like, I'm grabbing material. Because you know, I don't believe in buying new wood. I don't want trees cut down for my benefit. I like recycling old wood and making something look old fashioned. So in that, um, I saw Sergio working with his guys, and I didn't know who he was, I didn't know he was the boss, but I just saw his pointing and talking, and I said, that might be the big boss. I thought he was the guy in charge of the contracting group, you know, the workers. So eventually the dumpster started getting dirty. Now here we go, they're digging out the basement. I see chunks of cement, and I see dirt, and I come out there every moment, because not right next door, I had my booth right in the front. I had two walls of art display case and a little museum thing showing lit up artifacts and I entertained everybody looking like this or more so, uh, a little more old fashioned and um, so I started scanning the dirt in the dumpster and I found a shard and a shell and a little piece of a bottleneck and I'm like oh my god, there, this is an old building. I looked at the building and I said this is 1825 to 30 building. This is a well to do nice neighborhood at the time. I said there's got to be the remains of Privy, the old outhouse well in that back of this building. But now I know it was a basement. That was a, once a backyard. You got your building, your backyard, and come along 1880 or so, they dig away that 10 feet of the backyard and put more structure up to make more volume in the building. So when they dig away the backyard, they usually cut the well away, but not all of it. If it's a deep enough well, you got the best part, the bottom part is what you want, down under the ground. So what happened was, I started to get a little friendly with Sergio and mention about bottles, and I collect them, and I go digging for them, he goes, oh, I found some bottles in my walls with the workers, can I show them to you? I said, well, come on in and see what I do, and bring them in, yeah. So he comes by with a couple beer bottles from the 1890s, he says, this is great, this is 1890s local beer bottle, this is about 1920s, cool. I said, this is my bottle, this is, this is what I had some bottles, this is my art. And we got talking, and I said, you know, Sergio, I know you're digging away your basement, and I see this the rubble and the dirt coming out, I said, you got the remains of a privy vault in the back of your building where the old yard used to end. He goes, what do you mean? What, what's a privy? And I'm like, you know, it, it's an outdoor toilet. And they threw some trash in them through the periods of the life of the building, you know? So I ended up at, I said, if I could just save that stuff, maybe you could use it as a display. And he goes, you want to go look? And I'm like, ooh, he's inviting me down. That's pretty quick. So he goes, come on, let's go now. And I'm like, get my good clothes, but I don't care. It's all dirt trenches and dust and guys working and they're laying pipe and shoveling and I'm working my way back and he leaves me for a little bit to search for what I might think is evidence, you know, of the privy. So I get back there in the dirt and I start looking around and I, I don't see really well, he's got some bulbs hanging. And I start kicking out the dirt and scuffing, I find an oyster shell. <laughs> now there's no reason for an oyster shell to be down in the dirt at 10 feet. You know, if, this, if there was no privy there, 10 feet below the ground surface will not be an oyster shell or anything man-made or brought in by man. It's going to be really ancient layers from who knows how far back in time. So, I got an oyster shell fragment. And that's, he came to me, he said, see anything? You see any evidence? I'm like, I got one oyster shell. I said, but Sergio, it means that the well was here. It means that they cut it away. And at some point, there's, there should be shards and bits of glass and coal ash existing, but it was just one shell. And he goes, well, what do you want to do? How do you want to go about this? I said, I need to bring a shovel. And a, and a digging stick, and I, I need to take a better look with a flashlight. Because we'll, we'll, when do you want to start? I said, you don't have a lot of time. I'm going to be laying in cement floor in a few days. I said, well, when do you think? He goes, well, how about Monday, next week? It was like at the end of the week. I said, 
do. Fine. Let's just do it. So I come along. Now it's 98 degrees or 96 degrees that day. More humid than it is out there. Get into that basement and it's sweltering hot. You know, it's sweltering. I'm wearing a hard hat. And I get to work and I start to dig, right? And I'm in raw dirt. Where I think the privy should be dead center, I'm just seeing raw soil. And I'm like, God, no good. Dig again. Sandy dirt again. No good. I said, come on, I found a shell. Where is this stupid well, man? I'm trying, I'm trying. Then I bank on a rock. And I said, oh, now these wells are made of stone, field stone. Hit a rock, and I say, cover it, cover it, but I'm on the outside of the well, I guess. So let me take a couple pieces forward. I'm on my knees as I work. I crawl up a little bit, and I put my shovel in and start to scratch. And the dirt came out gray brown with little bits of coal ash stuck in a piece of glass. I said, that's it. I'm in the privy. Okay, now let me figure out. Got on the inside of it, and I start clearing the, the dirt away from that bit of a stone. I found another stone, another stone. I start clearing, and I dug my way all around the well. So the well is about six and a half feet wide. And after I circled it out and got all that dirt out of there, I'm starting to uncover bottles. And I'm starting to uncover pottery. And I'm looking like I'm in the Civil War period. So Sergio comes, you getting anything? I'm like, yeah, I got a couple of bottles. I'm hitting up. I got the well. Look at it. It's right there. It's a circle. He goes, wow, is that, that's it? I said, well, it's going to go down some more, I hope. We could be at the bottom, or we, we could be still this far from the base, you know? So he comes back and forth to visit, and sure enough, the, the pottery shards are piling up, the bottles are piling up. Now, normally, I dig these things in someone's backyard, or I might dig them on a construction site. And we use a tripod, a wheel, a rope, and a compound bucket, those big white buckets, to pull the dirt up with. We put a ladder down the hole, and we work it slowly, day by day, down. Um, in this, I'm the only one there. I don't have a crew. And I'm hand throwing the dirt out. It's like accumulated, you know? It ended up that I had to dig down seven feet to reach bottom. So I'm below my head, but not by much, you know? But I worked my way down on one side and cleared the base. And then I started working my way this way and throwing my waste dirt that way. Couldn't sift, which I normally do. Um, but I did my best to hand pick the pottery. I do restore my own pottery. I have pieces displayed all over the house. And um, that I fixed and repaired. I self-taught how to fix a pottery. So I ended up that, um, in the end, I was really feeling like, wow, well, Sergio is going to make this historic kind of display out of his premises. I'm going to try and like give as much of this as I can to Sergio to use the display. So it took about a day and a half to finish the dig. I covered my hole up, and that's Zach. And out of all the things, I gave Sergio everything out of the well, all the boxes, and I kept one. And the pottery shards I wanted, because if they didn't mend or glue enough to be a display, I make jewelry out of them. So I have a jewelry line from pottery fragments, glass, coins, and like that, and my artifact art. So I had a little bit to make art with, a little bit to make jewelry with, or the mass of pottery, and. I knew that I could make a display for him, so I started discussing. We can make a display. I can make shadow boxes, and we can put your bottles up. And he started, yeah, we can put them over here. And we got these ideas rolling. We had about 40 bottles. He goes, well, what do you want out of this? I said, I only want one bottle. I said, Sergio, I've had all these over and over. I know them well. There's only one thing I don't own that I'd like to hang a display. It's called a torpedo bottle. This torpedo bottle was made in egg shape like this. There it is. It dates from about 1850 or 60. And it's a Dublin, it says here, Bully and Evans, Dublin, and London. What this is, is a seltzer water, or a bubbly water. And the two things came in them, like a seltzer water, bubbly water, and also ginger beer. But Schweppes, way back in like 1809, had complaints that their, their bubbly water was going flat in clay bottles in storage in bars and restaurants. So they would seep through the um, cork, the carbonation. Schweppes hired an engineer and said to the guy, make a bottle that's going to hold that carbonation for us and not get lost. So they developed, this engineer developed a bottle that could never be stood up. It had to be laid down like a wine bottle in storage. That way, keeping the cork wet and carbonation would always be strong. So they're called egg torpedoes or torpedo bottles by collectors. The egg-shaped ones are from the earlier periods, and the cylinder ones with a thick round bottom are from the later years of 1870s and 80s. So anyway, Schreps making this shape made these bottles a fantastic shipping, and they used it in ballast and chips, and they stayed fresh, 
But I did read in one of my history books out of Old New York, in the Bowery, when bar fights broke out, this was the preferred really <laughs> 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 Whack somebody with this and not break the bottle on their head. And that whole thing with the cowboy movies and they smash the whiskey bottle comes from the Bowery with these these um, torpedo bottles. So it, it was passed on from those times into the movie industry. So um, I told them this is the only thing I don't have in my collection. All the rest that I'm giving you I've already owned. And I don't need to resell them because I sell bottles and make a living. I'm the bottle man at the flea market. And then we do. Um, 14th Street Union Square holiday market at Christmas time, Bellarm. And um, we set up a little booth. And I wear a Lincoln hat or this hat, whatever what I'm in the mood for, and entertain the public with um, tales and you know, digs. And what. But in my lifetime, I've almost died three times in sites with big mud wall cave ins. That was with Zach twice on um, South Street Seaport sites where the mud walls were vertical and were undermining them and digging in dangerous spots with overhangs, and those would collapse. And I had one night alone in there where I almost died. Um, it was really weird how life is. Zach, and I don't want to keep this too going too long because I'm a storyteller and I go too long. <laughs> and it ended up then. Zach and I went month after month to this site, this one site, and we're really doing a good job of retrieving almost every night. I worked in a deli with him, and we'd get out at like 10 o'clock at night, and by 11.30 we were downtown with our equipment, because we carried it to work with us, to dig in the site and sneak in. So we made this a regular thing. One night, Zach's girl said, Zach, you've been going to that site so much, I can't take it. I can't take it. If you go tonight, we're breaking up. And he said, Scott, I can't go tonight. I'm in trouble with him. I can't do it, you know. You, I, I, I get, I'm really sorry. So I go by myself. And that's the first time I've gone inside alone. And it's kind of spooky, you know. When you're down at South Street Seaport in that black mud, you smell the, the mud. It gives off like a, a earthy kind of rivery, sulfury smell. You can smell the beams of the um, docks that are breaking up with the machines, that yellow pine. So, and when you're in there and the fog is around, it feels like you're, you, you were underneath where those ships were, you know, where they pulled in a dock. So you get that sensation of the 18th century New York in that site. Because it's all still there, like a lot, you know? So I'm in a site. They dug away most of it. And there's a remaining one bit of mud wall before the site was all dug out. This wall was like uh, 60, 80 feet wide and about 25 feet high or more. Vertical wall, but the machine is actually in the street. And it goes like that. It digs the mud out and goes to the truck in the street, drops it in. This is black river clay that's very dense. So, I get in there and I'm running my metal detector on the wall. Now I carried my, in those days, a burlap bag over my back with my shovel and my metal detector and my change of boots. I had rubber boots I put on and I put my sneakers in that bag. Well, the first reading I got was this um, lead barrel shaped thing that's a, a scale weight. At the time I didn't know what it was, but it was a big piece of lead, like a little barrel. I said, oh, I'll put that in the burlap bag. And I start to get another reading. I have headphones on. Because you hear your beep beep in there. I got to get another reading, but it was kind of high. And it was long. And I heard of the workers finding these little rail cannons from the ships in the site. We got word that they had found one. I said, maybe it's one of those rail cannons, but I, I, I don't have anything to get up, you know? There's no board, a box, nothing in this. It's just mud chunks. And so behind me was a slight sloping hill and a pond of water. Because they had pump men come to suck out the water from the site seeping in. So it had to be always pumped up, but there was like a four-foot pond as big as this room of water behind me, downhill. So I'm beeping again. I said, forget about that thing. Let me go somewhere else, because there's so much room. You can look anywhere. So I get another reading, and as I'm holding my machine against the wall of mud, I felt little trickle up hitting little chunks touching my head. And that means a piece is breaking free, and you better look up. I look up at the wall, and the whole wall's going like this, boom! And I just turn and ran that way. And in the running action, if you ever slap water and it goes like this, that's what happened under my feet. As I ran, the pressure of the mud wall was pushing the mud up under my feet to rise. And I got catapulted through the air. And I landed on the other end of the pond with all the mud going whoop, right to the back of my legs when I slapped down on the ground. Holding my metal detector, I ran and lost my shelter, but it got stuck in the mud. And after the big crash and the pond filled in, there was a mountain of mud. I almost died. Oh my God. I almost died. And I got myself composed. The guard never woke up. He was on the floor asleep. <laughs> but they were. And I composed myself, shaking. Pray to God for not killing. Let me die. Thank you, God, for that. I'm still alive. Oh, I started the chunks. And I got like 
a, a vial, a revolutionary war uh, pharmaceutical vial from a doctor. I got shoe buckles, buttons, bullets. I was got so much in the trunks, it was stuff everywhere, but I was felt too shook up from that almost death experience. I feel like the guard can come out and see me now on the wide open, those yellow beam lights are on me, no longer in the shadow that so I said, I gotta go. I'm shaking, this is too much. Went home, called Zach, and I said, Zach, we almost died tonight. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? He goes, do you want to hear a story now? He goes, okay, it's 1.30, but yeah, yeah, I'll listen to it. So ended up, I told him the story, and I, I said, man, if you were there, he was always down on his knee like, no. one of us would have died. Somebody would have died. Mm -hmm. So they took the mud out and brought it down by the, the bridges there where they had the path marked on by the Manhattan Bridge. Where they, they were storing the mud in a big pile, you know, and there was a guy named Junior pushing the plow and pushing the mud. And there was no fence. You could walk under the site. He let me metal detector in the daytime. So I went over to Junior and I said, hey, Junior, I want to tell you something. And he stopped the machine. He goes, what is it? And I said, the last night I was on the site and I almost died from a giant mud wall cave in. I said, um, I lost my burlap bag. So if you happen to see it, could you retrieve it for me? Because it's got my sneakers in it and it's lit. Wait. And he goes, you are so full of, you know, come on, this is just bullshit. You know? So uh, I said, no, it really happened, Junior. And um, so the trucks were pulling in. There's these long trucks unloading the mud. And it's splashing and gooing out, you know? The third truck that rolls in, they spill the mud out. And there's my bag. I said, that's my bag. And he goes, yours. I think that's your silk. Pull on my leg, man. That's what they use for bolts and nuts. And he just laughed at me. I climb over the piles, and I get my bag out of the mud. And it's my bag. The sneakers are gone, but the lead weight is in there. I said, look, there's the lead weight, man. He goes, oh, my god. He goes, I would have found you in this but flattened out like this. He goes, you, you are telling me the truth. He goes, you got to be careful on those sites at night, man. Blah, blah, blah. And that was the end of that. That's one of the stories of how, I mean, that was the big one. I did write a book about my life digging, and it's out of print now, but uh, it's a color picture book about my collection and what I found. But meeting Sergio and getting the opportunity allowed me to s display something in some kind of, you know, nice environment, you know? It's been a really nice friendship. We're going to uh, just show a couple of slides of the during the construction, and then we're going to go uh, on a tour after a couple of questions. Right, so this, I don't know if you remember, is a. Uh, picture of what Kenny's used to look like. The sign was removed, but above each one of those blue lines was Kenny's casket. This uh, picture was taken in the first two. Before we took possession of the space back in April of uh, 2013. Sorry, we took possession of it. This is a picture that was taken in April of 2013. Uh, the owner, Kenny, they took it with them. So there were two, uh, his two children, Tom and Maria, uh, after, while they were selling the, before they sold the property, they took as much of the, of the uh, signs and, and a lot of the things that were in the space, the memorabilia they took with them. Um, here's actually, uh, here is, Walking into the front door, the, the, the small vestibule, everything was red. Um, on the left side there, you can see the bar. Behind the bar, behind the bar was a um, a small door that led to the basement. Um, it was the only access that we had to get to the basement. So there's no other way. So you know, if people, I, I'm not sure, but I believe it might have been the same access to to the slide back in uh, 18. Uh, again, this is another picture from the other angle. You see the one, the, the uh, beautiful tin ceiling that was there. <clears throat> Got a little uh, detail. Again, when we, we, we took possession in May of 2013, the landlord had to do structural changes to the floor, the second floor. So they removed a lot of the tin and a lot of the joists that were in the in the second and the third floor. There were structural issues. Again, this is a, a little closer to the, to the stage. You, you still see the staircase on the right. There was another staircase on the left, uh, which is, the, this is a picture of that as well. Uh, 
Uh, this is the one we actually dismantled and kept in our storage uh, space, our warehouse. And we brought back to use as a decorative element. Uh, uh, we use it for a railing of our balcony, which we'll see later on the tour. That's the staircase. I mean, this is the this is again the the music room of Kenny's. There were bathrooms on either side of the stage. Uh, the, the the mezzanine, which we're on in now, had actually a hole cut out, so you could watch the bands as they perform from above. This is again a picture. So the staircase is from 1830. So this this staircase, not 1830. The the the, the building was only 50 foot deep till 1880. By 1880s, they didn't build the second, and that's probably where they put the, the, the double double staircase, which was typical back then. If you look at the old saloon, or old cowboy movies that show that in the saloons. There was some, they show some windows in the back. Again, these, uh, this mezzanine was supported by these beams, these red beams, that went all the way through the basement and were in footings in the basement. These are the, where the, the holes where the beam would go literally right through, and that's another a shot of an existing mosaic floor that wasn't in good condition, but that's the same, a piece of the same floor we have downstairs. And that's a view looking, looking uh, to the front of the building. These on the, on the side here, you can see the, the old beams that were removed from the second floor. That, that, that one's literally four inches by 12, and it's about 23 or 22 feet long. <clears throat> that's a character of the side of the beam. I think basically, that's where you'd see that the, the ceilings would be hung on that side. A picture of a steel joist, which actually is um, up there. And this is a picture of the basement. Also do a tour of. The basement had lolly columns throughout the entire center of the space to, to support the weight of the first floor. Uh, they were old wood joists. There's no way a wood joist could hold the support of uh, the first floor of a commercial space. So they would have to be supported in the middle, basically. Uh, it's a picture of the, the basement where the kitchen is now. We'll show you later exactly the spot. Picture of the kitchen. This is a, a picture of, a, of the old. Um, this is the actual drain line of the building. So it wasn't the sewers, but this is where the the um, the um, shaft, the um, gutters would, would, would tie into this. So this is basically rainwater. We had to replace all the plumbing. Luckily, we had a great landlord that helped, that understood that we were increasing the value of this building, and he. he helped us with the cost of it. It's a picture of the basement again. I mean, it was basically unusable the way it was designed with all these pillars. You couldn't really do anything with the basement. So we, we changed that with we put new steel joists in and there's no columns now. And this is a picture underneath the bar. I mean an example of what condition beams were. I mean it was pretty much a disaster. And not safe at all. Old meters, all the new meters we put in, gas, electric. And this is a picture above the tin ceiling. You would actually see what I was excited about. You can see the beautiful brick, which we left as much as possible, and the exposed beam, which we left as much as possible as well. This is us putting in the new steel joist. This is the floor we're on now. So these are the new steel joists that we're putting in. And we raised the ceiling of the music room, because the ceiling of the music room of Kenny was only eight feet high. So right now we have nine and a half foot ceilings in the music room, and our ceilings are high enough here. Again, that's where the old ceiling was. You can see where the joists mm -hmm. for that floor would go in. And that's another shot. Of As the, as the project is getting completed. And this is a, a, a kind of a cool shot. From the mezzanine, when you go down the steps, you'll look down and you'll see exactly this shot. Here they're, they're removing 
the floor and installing the new floor at the same time. You can't remove the entire floor out because you're, you, the stability of the building, the building is, is at jeopardy. You can only do 20 to 25 feet at a time. <laughs> and then this is a, a video of, of we took out a big chunk of the floor here. And you can kind of see, you can kind of see that's the basement. And that's uh, my crew. Uh, just they're working on uh, putting in the plumbing's already laid, and they're working on building, putting the new footings for the new perimeter walls and partitions. We'll be building downstairs. So it's a kind of a cool shot. It's uh, you can actually see. Uh, I mean, you get to see the basement. You get to see the music room, and then you get to see where we are right now. I mean, it was a war zone. To say <laughs> I mean, you know, I literally, I think I almost had a nervous breakdown building it in the middle of it because I, I was like, what am I doing? This is crazy. It was really, uh, it was really a, it was really a, a huge project. It, it, we, we, we took possession May, May 1st. We did deconstruction uh, till June, to about middle of June, then we started doing, we did the cement floors in, in July, so all the deconstruction was till the end of June. By the middle of July, we, we poured the concrete in the basement, and then we poured the, um, then we, we, we put the metal decking in. Um, so we finished the project, most of the construction was done by January, end of January, so from May 1st, the general. It was pretty quick considering we did it all with an 18-man crew. That was including plumbers, electricians, carpenters, masons, uh, tilers. We did it all in, uh, in about seven, seven months. And here's a, a shot. This is the, 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 the privy well that Jordan was talking about, that Scott was talking about. There he goes. Yeah. <laughs> seven feet in. You know? Wait, wait, wait. That's about six and a half feet wide. It was right dead in the dead center in the, in the, in the back of the property line. And then this is a, this, a picture of the steel um, flywheel we talked about. And this is a, a this is, it took six guys to lift it up and mount it. We mounted it to the brick wall, which we'll see right after this. That's a giant wheel. So heavy. Yeah, it's cast iron. I mean, it, it weighed, uh, what do you think it weighed, Scott? Uh, four or five hundred pounds. Like at least. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, everybody's watching their toes when they put it on that peg. <laughs> <laughs> like, that thing comes off, we jump. What is it used for? It, 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 once a steam engine spins that wheel, the wheel takes its own force right. to make the, the belts go. So they right. had right. an industry upstairs with these belts running and something spinning. They're grinding or doing some kind of work with those. Uh, chin and then as the space starts taking shape, the floors are already laid. The, the, uh, we start doing the woodwork. We start bringing the beams back. So we're using all that. All that is a paneling that we use. And the storefront, like you can see, you can see, if you look at the storefront now, you see the actual beams. We made frames out of the beams. The doors were made out of them. And we, we, we tried, and that was the. Uh, that was a railing that we spoke about that we used when we uh, deconstructed the staircase. And that's what we have today. That's the new